Welcome back to our series, Prairie Avenue Spotlight, where we will showcase the surviving houses on historic Prairie Avenue in Chicago's South Loop. This week, we will look at the history and architecture of the Reese House, including its relocation in 2014. As was the case with the Coleman House last week, this house was designed by Henry Ives Cobb of the firm of Cobb and Frost. Both are excellent examples of the Richardsonian Romanesque style, but this one is quite different, as we shall see. In 1888, Harriet Reese, a 71-year-old widow, paid $15,000 for a 25-foot wide vacant lot on the 2100 block of Prairie Avenue. She hired Cobb and Frost to design the house, which was squeezed in between existing houses to the north and south. It was completed the next year at a cost of $20,000. Her late husband, James, was an early pioneer of Chicago, arriving here in the 1830s, serving as the first city surveyor, and making a fortune as the co-owner of the first land title abstract business in the city, which survives today as the Chicago Title and Trust Company. An interesting feature of the house was a manually operated elevator, one of the first ever to be placed in a private residence. The crank can be seen in the photo at left. The right photo shows the elevator shaft looking up from the first floor. It is interesting to note that the Reese House, seen on the left, has a virtual twin at 77 East Elm Street in the Gold Coast, seen on the right. Built a few years after the Reese House, what is most interesting is that the architect is not Cobb and Frost. It is Charles Palmer. He was the architect who designed many of the houses for Potter Palmer as he developed the Gold Coast neighborhood around his castle. Harriet Reese died in 1892 after enjoying her house for just three years. It was sold to Edson Keith Jr., who had married the previous year. He had grown up on Prairie Avenue in his parents' home on the 1900 block and went into the family millinery business. Edson Jr. and his wife raised their family here, including two sons and a daughter. In 1916, the Keith's daughter, Catherine, married the prominent Chicago architect, David Adler. She was an author of some note and penned two books, including the semi-autobiographical novel, The Girl. She died in a tragic car crash in France in 1930. The same year as Catherine's wedding, her parents left their Prairie Avenue home and built a new house in Sarasota, Florida, where there was a large colony of Chicagoans, including members of the Marshall Field and Potter Palmer families. Designed by Otis and Clark, the Keith's home was eventually acquired by Sarasota County, and it stands today in Philippi Estate Park, where it can be rented for private events. Let's look at a few of the architectural details of the Reese House. This house is a good example of the Richardsonian Romanesque style as it matured, the major difference being the use of smooth-faced stone, in this case, Bedford limestone. Rusticated stone, seen on buildings like the Coleman and Glessner houses, is used here only for the basement level of the house. The two-story curved bay window features a beautifully carved rinso frieze between the first and second floors. The decoration utilized by Cobb shows the influence of both H. H. Richardson and Louis Sullivan. One of the most striking features of the house is the grouping of five arched windows set behind a colonnade on the third level. Note the richly carved detailing including different capitals on each column and basket weave and foliate decoration above. Equally detailed, the top of the cross gable features a huge panel of carved decorated stone set above a tiny window illuminating the attic level, highlighted with an OG arch overhead. Copper detailing, including the frieze atop the bay window and the scupper box concealing the union of the gutters and downspouts, features embossed decoration that utilizes the same design motifs seen in the stone. After the Keiths left Prairie Avenue, the home began its use for nearly 50 years as a boarding house. Following World War II, 
Revere Camera Company built one-story factory buildings to either side of the Reese House, as seen in this view from the 1950s. Artist Jack Simmerling drew the house several times, including this pen and ink sketch where he imagined the house without the intrusive factory buildings to either side. Frank Satino, shown here, operated two restaurants in the area just south of Cermak Road, where McCormick Place stands today. In the 1960s, after selling those businesses and other buildings, he acquired the Reese House. One day, he dined at Shea Paul, located in an old mansion on the north side, and Frank got the idea to open a similar restaurant in the Reese House. The Prairie House Cafe opened in September 1968 and specialized in Italian cuisine. There were three separate dining rooms on the first floor, located in the two parlors and the original dining room. It was only open on weekdays as it catered to people working in the area. The upper floors were used as the residence of the Satino family, including Frank, his brother and sister, and their families. Prairie House Cafe operated for several years and closed shortly before Frank died in 1975. The current owners of the house acquired it in 2001. After undertaking significant restoration work, it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2007 and was designated a Chicago landmark in 2012. Here we see the historic view of the house and the exact same view as it appeared in early 2014, the Reese House being the last survivor of the once elegant block. McCormick Place's expansion north of Cermak Road included plans for a large arena to occupy a full block which included the site of the Reese House. In April 2014, the Commission on Chicago Landmarks approved moving the house to a vacant site at 2017 South Prairie Avenue, next door to the historic William Reed House, shown here at left. The new site of the Reese House had originally been occupied by the William Armour House, shown at right. Designed by Treat and Foltz in 1881, it was torn down in the 1950s. The first part of the project involved moving the coach house, which was much older than the main house, having been acquired by Reese with the lot in 1888. It may predate the Chicago fire. Constructed of Chicago common brick, the coach house weighs 187 tons. It was cut off of its foundation and raised onto six dollies. The new site was prepared by digging a foundation and filling it with cribbing, heavy wood timbers that would support the weight of the dollies that moved the structure. In just over an hour, on the morning of October 1st, 2014, the coach house was rolled several hundred feet to its new location. Here we see the coach house in place. Once the new foundation was built up to the bottom of the building, the cribbing was all removed, making it a self-supporting structure once again. The move of the main house took much longer. At 762 tons, the solid masonry structure is believed to be the heaviest single-family home ever moved in the United States. Huge steel girders were punched through the basement level of the building to support the house. The foundation walls were then cut away. The house was placed atop 29 motorized dollies, each with eight wheels, distributing the weight across 232 huge rubber tires. Here we see the house sitting on the dollies. You will also notice the steel framing around the entire building, added to ensure it would remain perfectly vertical and not shift during the move. With the dollies and steel framing in place, the entire weight was more than 1,000 tons. On November 11, 2014, the house began its move, continuing north to Cullerton Street, where it rested for the night. The foundation had already been prepared, as seen at right, and was completely filled with the heavy timber cribbing to support the structure. On day two, the house was slowly backed onto the lot. Think of a three-point turn on a very large scale. 
It took several hours of meticulous work, with the house being moved an inch at a time. Finally, a bell rang mid-afternoon to indicate the move was complete. It took several months to then rebuild the foundation and make the house ready for occupancy. The total cost of the project was more than $8 million. Today, the house looks right at home next to the Reed House, and visitors to the neighborhood can continue to appreciate its elegantly detailed facade and its remarkable survival. That concludes our look at the Reese House. We hope you will join us next week for our new installment of Prairie Avenue Spotlight.